What is going on, people? It's Elijah from my chargeback. Before we get started, please don't forget to click a like and subscribe. And if you've been the victim of a scam, any scam, click the link below in the description to speak to us. Now, let's get started. So today, I kind of wanted to give a comprehensive overview of how crypto recovery works and what it means to go through the process. So this is very important, and I want you to bear with me. And stick around because the information here makes the difference between whether a scam victim gives themselves a chance or whether the same faults that led to being scammed in the first place let you down through the process. So let's start with the actual process themselves. If you've been with me, you've heard the three steps before, blockchain forensics, KYC, and then a recovery mechanism. Now, I'm going to take a minute to go a little bit more in the detail on each of these three steps. Now, bear in mind, you can't skip steps. All right? This is the first thing. All right? Everybody wants to jump to the finish line. Everybody has been conditioned to uh, buying online. You buy something on Amazon. You can smash it on the floor with a smile on your face and return it the next day for a full refund. This is not the world you have stepped into. The second you gave money to a crypto scammer, crypto scammer is just willing to accept crypto payments, you have stepped into a world where all of those rules went out the door. All right, this is not something where you can stomp your feet and demand to speak to a manager. So, pay attention. So, everything begins with the blockchain. Now, if you're wondering what the blockchain is, there are actually, I believe, 92 different blockchains. All right, it is a digital ledger distributed with all the transactions listed. That's why when they say there's no hiding on it, there isn't. All right, Bitcoin is your oldest blockchain, right? It is an open blockchain. In theory, anybody can edit it, but it's really run by a bunch of secretive programmers around the globe. All right, Ethereum, the largest blockchain. All right, it's like, uh, it's kind of like the Google of blockchains most of your nfts most of your altcoins most of that stuff is on the ethereum blockchain and there are a number of other ones all right a lot of rug pulls i think last month in may there were 54 million in rug pulls 37 million were on the bnb blockchain that's binance's blockchain where if you want to mint a nice new coin and then pull a rug pull no problem all right, something like 37 million worth of that 54 million was done on the BNB chain, and that's been the most popular one for scammers who go and pull rug pulls for quite some time, followed by the Ethereum blockchain. Good luck trying to do it on the Bitcoin blockchain, as it is they're at war with themselves because of their introduction of Ordinal's NFTs, where the purists are having a fight with the innovationalists. Now, more to the point... With the rare exception of privacy coins, all of this stuff is open. All of it is easy to view. And so when a scammer takes a token, all right, let's say for argument's sake, let's say you give the scammer one Bitcoin a day, all right? What he is probably going to do is he is probably going to do several signs that show more or less that he is trying to run a scam. He could try to split it up into smaller numbers and combine it with other people's money. He could put it through tumblers and try and convert it into other cryptocurrencies and back into Bitcoin. It's getting a little risky to do these days. He could try and do use a bridge and wrap it and put it on the Ethereum blockchain, but chances are he's not going to do that because Bridges are a great place for hackers, and hackers scare the living heck out of scammers. Pardon me for being so harsh in my words, but they do because hackers are smarter than scammers. Now, he may try to do a whole number of things. He may try to use a crypto mixer, but he's probably going to move it through, you know, I don't know. He could move it through only a handful of wallets, or he could move it through thousands of different wallets before he takes it to a final place where it is cashed out or where it's sitting. But in our experience of 
thousands upon thousands of crypto traces, over 90%, 94% are cashed out because scammers are not interested in going to Starbucks and paying with Bitcoin. They're just not. All right, that's why most of the stuff these days is Tether. It's a stable coin. They want a dollar for a dollar, a euro for a euro. But what we have is the foundation of the investigation. In other words, you can't do anything without that. Everything that you have without that trace and that evidence of what they have been doing with it inside the blockchain, there's nothing you can do without it. All right. You can have all of the WhatsApp conversations, all of the emails. You can say they said this on the phone to you, that on the phone, all of the screenshots, all of the web stuff. Without that blockchain forensics and knowing where it went and how it got there, it's utterly useless. Absolutely, totally, and utterly. And I'm going to get to why. Because when we move to the second stage, what happens here is that you need to get a KYC. Now, that involves taking the blockchain forensics to law enforcement. So somebody like us will get you the blockchain forensics, and we're going to help you out getting it to the police. By that, I mean we're going to explain to you what to do. And what's going to happen is that they are going to subpoena the final exchange that it went at. So let's say, for argument's sake, you bought your Bitcoin at, I don't know, Coinbase. And the scammer cashed it out at Binance. That would mean that you would take this report prepared by us to the police with our instructions. And you would file it. And the police would use Binance's police portal to ask them for the KYC. That is the know your customer. All right? That is the person associated with with that account, all right, their name, their phone number, a copy of their ID, there's a whole bunch of personal info. That is the person you go after, all right? So I want to make this clear, all right? Everybody's like, do you know this about this XYZ, broker or FXP, whatever, it doesn't matter, okay? Only that KYC matters, all right? When these scam operators run this stuff, they have a nice big call center, or a big text messaging center in the case of pig butchering scams. All right. They have so, so many different websites that they're running at once. All right. Every time these guys get busted, and they do get busted, they are usually running at least four or five different websites. So the name is irrelevant. Maybe, maybe, maybe down the road, when we get to phase three, I'll explain how. Possibly that could be relevant, but uh, no, you need that KYC. That's it. That KYC is the person who owes you your money. Now, you're probably wondering right now, what if they're not in the country? Okay, you think you're the only person going after them? No. You know how many of these people get extradited? Did you know that you can pursue criminal cases in other countries? If the guy is in Spain, hey, there's a nice hot center right now for Forex scams. You think that they can't be pursued there? You can't be a scam victim there? Uh, I've seen so many different people go and execute these cases in foreign countries. They're going to say they're in China. They're in Hong Kong. You think they don't you go after them there? You think that if the scammer's sitting in Hong Kong, you can't go after them? Think again. And by the way, how many of those have been exported? So many of those. The pig butchering scams, the famed ones out of Southeast Asia. Those guys pop up all over the place. In Brooklyn, in Columbus, Ohio, in Sydney. Your classic Nigerian romance scammers getting busted in New Jersey, in Dallas. I believe there was also another one in Melbourne and Sydney. Don't think just because it's a foreign scam doesn't mean that they aren't either local or that they can't be pursued in their country of residence because that's exactly what happens. All right? So, you got to get that KYC because that's the biggest 
biggest thing. That's who has your money. That's who owes you your money. All right, it doesn't matter. They said uh, their name was Alice or Alicia or Allison or Jason or Ben on the phone, whatever. It doesn't matter. All right. When you get that KYC and their name is Scammer McScammerson, that's who has your money. And that's who owes you your money. Do you understand? Good. Now, let's get to the third part. And the part that you're already like jumping up and down, you see like, this like that guy, tell me I'm going to get my money back. Where do I get my money back? Where do I get my money back? Give me, give me, give me, give me. Hold up there. So, we now have our KYC. So, now we move to the actual recovery mechanism. All right. Your recovery mechanism is what forces the KYC to give you your money back. This could be several different ways, and there's a whole lot of different ways this could go, depending on who the KYC is. It could be a criminal trial, which is probably going to be the case most of the time, because usually uh, when these people get ID'd through the subpoena, usually what they want to do is they want to accumulate cases against a particular scammer and then pursue it in larger numbers. So this is probably the most common way for it to happen. Sometimes there are negotiations and they give it back to you to make you go away. Other times there are civil suits. I have seen this one happen a few times in civil court. Um, it's a, it's also, it's a, it's a way to go. All right. If you're up for it. Uh, it could be in the best case scenario that the exchange simply decides, look, you lost a Bitcoin. This guy has a Bitcoin in his wallet. We're just going to give you that Bitcoin. Now, you can't bank on that. And there are a whole slew of other scenarios. There are lawsuits. There are innumerable different scenarios that this can take place in. But that is where the recovery itself takes place now what do you get back do you get back crypto do you get back cash will it be the exact same amount that you lost will it be more will it be less okay the answer is it could be crypto it could be cash it could be all of what you lost it could be and i would bet more likely be at least part of what you lost because chances are that some of that will have been gone all right usually when recoveries take place uh it's partial if it's whole no complaints there all right that happens a lot too it's just that partial is more common and it's painting a more realistic perspective on it so this depends on what they have left all right a lot of times you will see a mix of crypto and fiat money because they'll have cashed everything out but when you're looking at the accumulation of all of their fiscal assets, it's going to be both. And the payout, when ordered by a court or by whatever else, will probably be some combination of those things. If everything's in a bank, then it's a bank transfer. Now, how do you calculate something like that? Okay. You have what the real value, what you sent the scammer. All right. Let's say you set the scammer a Bitcoin. All right, Bitcoin was at, I don't know, hovering somewhere a little over 26,000 today, closer to 27. Let's say in a week, it's worth 28,000. Well, then you're getting back one Bitcoin. You're going to say, wait a second, I was scanned out of 26,000. Well, yeah, but in this case, you're getting 28 back. Or it could be the converse. It could be worth 24 the next week. You're still getting the same amount you lost, one Bitcoin back, but it's worth less in fiat. <laughs> so when you send crypto and you're getting crypto back, you are getting the same amount in crypto back, but there is a chance that the value in fiat has changed. So if there is a cash option and it is equal to what you thought you gave them because you thought you were giving them cash uh that's obviously preferable unless you know something good happens and the crypto market surges and i would not bank on that right now 
All right. I spent all day with this stuff. I would not bank on any of that. Now, here are some other realities that come with the process. You have to learn to think differently and you have to be patient. It's very easy to lose money and it's very quick. Getting it back is a different ballgame. I can tell you right now, if you do not prepare yourself for something that will be at least a year, a year and a half, you're going to set yourself up for real problems. All right. This is working outside of the regulatory environment. Okay. When we talk about recoveries that take place via regulated payment methods, such as bank wires and credit cards, this all works in a scenario where there are rules and operations that take place within the financial system where you don't necessarily need law enforcement, where more government involvement takes place. All right, it's transactional. It's conducted by transactional professionals that work at that pace. Now, when you get to this point where you will have international law enforcement involved, this can be a very slow process. It's not that nobody's doing what they're supposed to do. It's just that this is not, you know, I could use the example earlier of e-commerce. It's not that. So you have to be ready for a fight. And you have to be ready to manage yourself. And you have to be ready to learn. All right, why do people get caught in crypto? People get caught in crypto because it's still new. Most people don't understand how the mechanisms work. Half the time, the people in crypto don't understand how the mechanisms work. And then they create something that totally locks up a blockchain like the Ordinals Collection on Bitcoin. Everything is new and everything involves learning. Everything involves watching the process. If you are not willing to be invested in the process, and believe me, this is not a passive thing. All right, there is no such thing as saying, oh, okay, uh, um, here's a couple of uh, text messages and some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, some wallets and, and stuff like that. Have fun, call me when it's done. That's not this. If you are not willing to be invested and active in the process, I guarantee you, it will not work. And I'm not saying this to scare you, but rather to mentally prepare you for what you're actually getting into. Because what you're getting into is really, in many respects, um, a field that's still being pioneered by us in this field. All right. Amongst the other things that we as a company do, it's not literally just helping you as scam victims. It's advising regulators. It's being part of the broader fintech industry and trying to bring other industry members that sometimes accidentally enable this stuff, particularly payment providers and Forex platforms, on board with the idea of, hey, you need to be careful because it's too easy for scammers to do this. All right, you need to be aware of how all of this happens. All right, you have to understand something. And I want you to understand why one of the big reasons that it's a fight and something that I think a lot of people don't get. Scammers work hard. They have jobs. They invest in this stuff. You can't just pop open an entire call center for free. You have to hire people. You have to pay for contact lists. You have to pay affiliate marketers. You have to invest in your own marketing efforts. They invest a lot of money into this stuff and a lot of time. This is a full-time job for them. They don't just let go that easy. All right, some of the bigger ones might say, okay, whatever, we'll throw it back like it's a refund just to make things go away. But in general, they want to fight too because while it's totally and utterly abhorrent and unethical, they did invest a lot of time and effort into it. So you got to be ready to fight, and they're going to fight. I guarantee you they are going to fight. I have seen it. I've seen what happens when the process works. I have seen what happens when the process doesn't work. And let me tell you, when the process doesn't work, it's usually because the scam victim was not prepared to do everything that they needed to. 
All right, there are other things that can make it not work, but in general, you are what drives it in the sense that you're going to be involved and you're going to be ready to fight. If you're not ready to fight, if you want to let them win so that they keep doing this to more and more people, walk away. But when you understand that it's not just about you, and your money, and it's a bigger thing, so, so much bigger, then you realize that you have to fight, and you have to be ready for it. So, I'm going to leave it there. I know this is a little bit more serious than the way I am normally in a lot of other videos that I put out, but this is me telling you a lot of important things that you need to know. So... If you've enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe. And if you're ready to fight, if you're ready to go at your scammer, click the link below and talk to us. I'm going to leave it there for today. I've been Elijah. We'll see you next time.